It says record it.
I'm going to put a methyl here so it's clear. That's the methyl. The methyl at the top, the ethyl's at the bottom. So it is, and here's vertical. Okay, there's vertical. Is the ground here or here? The ground is here because the ethyl is close to the ground. The methyl is above the ground. If I'm standing on the ground here, the methyl is up by my head, the ethyl is down at the bottom. The methyl is up by my head, the ethyl is down at the bottom. Here's the ground. Okay. On this top chirocarbon, the methyl is going this way, so I'm going to stand over here on the ground and look through there. And the methyl is going straight away on the board. As the methyl is going straight away, what's coming out towards y'all? GOH. And if I'm looking through here and it's coming out towards y'all, it's on my right. There it is. It's coming out towards y'all, and I'm looking through there. It's on my right. Is the fluoride on your left? No. Well, by default, it has to be because it's on the same carbon. It has to be right here. If I'm looking down through there, fluorine is dash. That means I'm just going to bring the board out here. I'm looking down the board, the mouth is straight down the board, the fluorine is going back. So as I'm looking down, the fluorine's on my left. So with the mouth going away, the fluorine's on the left. With the methyl going away, that's what that means, correct? Yeah. Fluorine's on the left. There you go. Okay. Now we're going to look at the thing that's going in the plane. The chlorine's in the plane, but it's going this way, so we need to stand over here. Keep your feet on the ground, though. I've seen some students look like this. They chlorine going away, this is on the right. Well, but your feet are in the air. Ground is over here. Chlorine going away, you see there, it's going away. With it going away, how is this ethyl projected? Towards y'all. To the, the chlorine going away, the ethyl is on my left, towards y'all. With the chlorine going away, well, I drew it in my. Let's. With the chlorine going away, the ethyl is on the left. So it's on the left. What's on the right? Well, the other thing there is an H. There it is, but it was asked you to put the methyl at the top and ethyl at the bottom. We need to rotate the ethyl down. And if we do that, we get no change at the top. The ethyl rotates down. The H goes over there. And the chlorine, this all this, this turns. The chlorine comes here. The methyl at the top, ethyl at the bottom. High priority group here is chlorine. High priority group here is F. Two. Three of them. How can you check yourself? Well, we're drawing the same compound. Whatever this is in terms of RS, that should be. Is this carbon here R or S? It's either one or the other. It's like it's under a hand. It's either left hand or right hand. Oxygen is one. I'm sorry, that's not one. Fluorine comes before oxygen, yeah, in terms of atomic number. Fluorine's one. Oxygen two. And then the carbon with the chlorine is three. Okay, we're going to have to put this on a fissure just to tell. Can someone, can someone determine that? We really need to put in a fissure to tell. We've already put in a fissure. It's easier to tell over here. Um, I mean, if I just wanted to put that in a fissure, I would just do the top half and look at it with the methyl going away. Now that I put it in here, it's hard to check when it's not easy. You've got to put in a fissure to determine it. What, okay, what's RS? We can determine it here much easier. Fluorine's one. Oxygen's two. Carbon with everything else is three. Carbon with just H's is four. Here the low priority group is actually a carbon. One, two, three, clockwise. The low priority group is going back. So what is it? Still clockwise. R. 
it's much easier to do RS there. If you want to just put one carbon in the fissure, you just do just like you did the top carbon. You look at it with something going away. carbon attached to all this other stuff over here. Fluorine is green, going back, fluorine green. Hydroxy is red. There's the compound on the board. Basically, if we look through here, that's what we got drawn here. If we look through here. I'm just going to turn so you can see what I'm seeing through here. Okay? If I turn, I'm also going to do this a little bit. With the methyl going back, what side's the OHO? Right. There's on the right, you see? With the methyl going back, the F is on the left, and all this other is coming down. The top part is like that. Look at it through here. Low priority group is the methyl. It's one, two, three. With the methyl going back, I mean, you got it right there. The methyl going back is one, two, three. It's clockwise. It's a little harder to do it there. I would say turn in here and then check your fissure, but it's, you really need to put it in a fissure to, to really see it. If this was easier to do right here, you could say, okay, it's R, and then you could come over here and say, yes, it's R. Let's look at the next carbon. Maybe it's easier to do here. What is this? We said this was R. What's this one over here? Chlorine is 1. Carbon with O is going to be 2. Carbon with carbon, with carbon is going to be 3. And the H is in the back. See, here's in the back. One, two, three, R. So you can easily see it's R there. It better be R over here. Chlorine is one. Carbon with OH is two. And ethyl is three. <coughs> one, two, three. Uh oh, it's counterclockwise. But the H is coming forward, so we reverse counterclockwise to what? Yes. Likewise, R. You see, it's the same thing. That one was easy to check because you didn't have to manipulate it to do RS because the low priority group was either forward or back. If it's forward or back, it's easy to do. Easier to do. So, uh, as we do, what was the difficulty? As to deal with the ground and what we're actually looking at the molecule. Or how to be looking at the molecule. Well, you, you want the ethyl at the bottom, meaning at home ground. Okay. At the bottom. That means ethyl's at the bottom, ethyl's at the top, the bottom and near the ground. So, the two chiral carbons, that's going to be in the vertical. So the ground is either up here or here. Which one's the ground? The ethyl is near the ground. That's what we, we want. So you stand on the ground, you look with things going away in the plane, with the chlorine going away. See, some I've seen students look saying, okay, the chlorine's going away, the ethyl's on my right. Yeah, but your feet are in the air. Because the ground is, your feet need to be down with the ethyl, this way. Now with the chlorine going away, Ethyl's on the left. You can't have your feet in the air. So if the charge priority group is not in the back, you can just rotate it until it is. If the priority group is in the front, you can just switch your answer. 
if it's in the if it's to the side, you have to you can't just put your answer. You have to look at it differently. Like this one. See so here the, the the low priority group is in the plane. It's neither forward or back. You really need to look at it this way, or you can turn it. You have to turn it, and if you turn it, you're essentially just drawing a fissure. That's turned. Br minus could add here, but that would not give that product. We're asked to show a mechanism for forming that product. Now, let's look at the product a little bit. A lot of times I say, well, don't even hardly look over here, just do what you know. Well, the first step we know, there's nothing else that we can really do. That's it. I know of no other first step that we could do. Here we could do lots of things. For example, we could add Br minus there. But that's not the problem. You've got to know kind of where you're going because there may be different routes. It's like if you get in your car and just drive down any road. I mean, if you don't know where you're going, any road works. You've got to know where you're going. But what, I, what you should not do is just stare at this and say, well, how do you get there? Take stock of it, but then come back here. Okay, it kind of goes a little bit both ways. Um, let's see. I still see that six-membered ring. That's a six-membered ring kind of laid out there, two, four, six, with a one-carbon bridge between here and here. But now it seems we have a six-membered ring with a, not a one-carbon bridge, but what? With a two-carbon bridge. And one of the carbons has two methyls on it. Now, I do have a carbon with two methyls here. If I get rid of that, it'll look like two methyls. Okay? Of course, there's H's on these carbons. Now, this one is a, a slight, it's kind of a little bit tough to see, uh, perhaps. It's hard for me to know because I've been looking at it for. 20, 30 times, and like, I can't remember when I first looked at it. Okay? You guys look at it for the first time, and I, I can't remember what you think. But, some type of rearrangement. What are carbocations prone to do? Rearrange. Rearrange. 
Well, what if we take these electrons and move them here? That is, rip them away from that carbon. Don't write this. I'm basically going to say, okay, here to there. What if we do that and then cations there? Well, that's not good because now the ring is 2, 4, 5, 7. We're not changing the ring size. So we don't want to move those electrons over. And of course, if I move these over, that'd be the same thing. Now, I can't really move a carbon over. I don't want to move an H over. Then I'd have a primary cation. If I wanted a primary cation, I should just put it there originally. What electrons can we move over instead? Can we break the How about this bridge? These two electrons, instead of these electrons bonded here, what if they break away and bond instead there? Now well, that's still there. But I'm going to, don't write anything until we kind of see it. I'm going to break the electrons away. See, that's electrons there. The atom is still there. That is, instead of bonding here, break it away and bond it here. That looks like a very long bond, but this could come up some. If that happened, where would the plus now be? This now has four bonds. What lost electrons if that shifted? Right there. Now let's look at that. That's still the six river ring there. What is the bridge now? One carbon, two carbon, then connect. One carbon, two carbon, and the second carbon has what on it? <laughs> two methyls. That's it. So let me do it again. This is originally here. What happens is these electrons break away from this carbon and end up bonding here. I mean, let me show you a, a shift without all the bonded there, and then we have that, kind of the bridge. There's that pointed bridge, and then under here we have that six member ring. But if I didn't have all that, what if I just did that? That is, break them away from there and add them and bond them here. It would now be bonded there. Well, I've kind of lost here, but basically the bond moves here to here. That's the same thing we're doing. Move from here to here. Uh, I'm going to show this sort of this breaking away from that carbon and bonding here. That's a plus. Let's show the result. I've already showed it, but it's good to show it the same exact way with just a new bond. So this is up. My bridge is going to look funny here. This is like this. Let me, let me again erase it. Instead of it bonded there, it's now bonded where? It's now bonded there. And that's a plus. Because that lost electrons. Now if we redraw this, what do we have? We've got that six membered ring in there with a bridge between here and here, and the bridge is a one carbon with nothing on it, and then another carbon with two methyls. That's going to look like this.
Here you go. Then how do you get the final product? Yeah. Yes. Here are our caps. Those electrons make the bond. Agent? Questions about This and then drew BR here and then said this gives that. I shouldn't say anything to the contrary. I mean, if you had the BR there, you get that. Also, keep in mind that for BR to be there, you must have had this cannon. Kind of and that's how the BR adds, it adds to the cation. So you could back it up from there and say, I need this. You gotta somehow make the connection that it was, a, it was this alkyl ship. Basically, this carbon, instead of bonded there, that carbon is now bonded there. To a alkyl ship. Alkenes, that's the only reactivity. Alkenes don't react with hardly anything. What's the electrophile here? H plus. What nucleophile is shown on the line? Water. You know, there's got to be a minus there, but apparently the minus is not important. It doesn't, or it's shown very generically. I see H plus in water. Okay, alkenes don't react with pure water. That's why an apple doesn't dissolve when it rains. The skin of an apple has the majority of the skin of the apple that consists of alkenes. But we know alkenes react with H plus. Which alkene do you want to react first? Well, you could look at this and see if you can determine it. We could also say, hey, if this reacts, we would put cation on left or right. Which would it be? It'd be either. Yeah. Either would be secondary. How about here? If, it, if we add a cat, cation on left would be secondary, cation on right would be? <laughs> Hopefully you would be rewarded by showing a tertiary cation. I mean, that's the easiest form. Hopefully, the easiest to form cation leads you down the right path. I'm going to say, let's react this alkene. These electrons pull away and get Hold on. I'm not pulling away from that carbon. I'm actually pulling away from the other carbon. And see, I wish textbooks would be better about this. Usually, textbooks just do an error like this. I, I wish it's it's better if you understand you're hinging this pi bond one way or the other. I, I'm going to break away from which carbon? Right. right. Correct. Break away from that one. So I'm going to kind of grab these electrons. It's like grabbing this end of the pen, pen and pulling them down to bond with the H. Pulling them down. Hinge them that way. What does that give? We now have a new bond to H right there, this carbon. And what is over this over here? Carbocation. It lost electrons in that process. It only has three bonds now. Okay, water could add here, and we would eventually get an alcohol. But that ain't that product. So what's the mechanism for forming this product? Obviously, a six-member ring has been formed. 
You get wings by one end attacking the other. If you look at Kekulay, who back in the 1800s is the first person that proposed the atoms that exist in rings, he said he had a vision of a snake coming around and grabbing its own tail. What over here could, could we have a cation? Things attack cations. They're electrophilic. Do we have electrons over here that could attack a cation? Yeah. Pi bond. Pi bond just attacked H plus. Why not pi bond attack C plus internally? How can this do this? We want a six-membered ring. What if one of these carbons attaches, attacks here? Like that carbon there attack that H. If this one attacked there, we'd have a one, two, three, four, five, six. Six member green. If this one attacked, we'd have a one, two, three, four, five. So which one ends up bonding there? That one, six member green. Could we get these could we get these electrons to break away from that carbon and have this carbon bond to that one? Yes. It'd be a six-member ring. Let me redraw this. Like this. See this, all this has free rotation. It could, it could come around and be sitting right there. And we would have, that's a transalkene. First carbon off has a methyl. CH2. Here's the new H that was added over there. The next carbon has two methyls. And what else is on this carbon? The carbon. Plus. So this is the same thing wrapped around to prepare us to make the six river ring. Now can you see these electrons breaking away from the top carbon like six million dollar man <laughs> and bonding there? Break them away and hinge them down there. Boom. What does that give? Six. Well, everything is there. There. This is like this. Two methyls. The new H is there. But instead of this here, these electrons have now done what? Move down there. Hinge down. And now they're bonded there. Where's the plus? Plus the Where's that? Where are the pi bonds? Yes, where are the electrons left? That gives that. Now let's take stock of what we got. I've got a six member ring. Can I get rid of this H? It, it just distracts me. It's there. I got a six member ring with one carbon having two methyls, an adjacent carbon having one methyl, then a cation, and then a methyl. Cation, then a methyl. Hold on. Still got water. If water added here, would we get that product? Let's back this up. What cation do I need? I need this cation. Then we can add water and eventually get there. What do I need to do here? Hydride. Actually, I need a hydride ship. Because the carbon in the methyl doesn't have an H on it. There's only one H here. There's two H's there. These electrons break away and come on here. Break them away. Grab them and pull them over. What does that give? Two methyls there. Methyl here. But now where's the cation? It's here. And there's an extra H here. I'll draw it in this one time. But that H moved over there.
Now what do we do? Now water adds to this cation. Those electrons add there. What does that give? Two methyls, one methyl, one methyl, oxygen. We haven't lost the H's. That oxygen has a plus charge. Every intermediate up here has, has a plus charge. How do we get final product? Something we, uh, takes the H, water can take it. If we have a minus here, the minus can take it. These electrons take the H. These electrons move on to oxygen. That gives that. And what do we reform? The H plus is reformed. That's actually a new water, because one water was consumed. But the H plus is reformed. So this was an example of a pi bond attacking a carbocation, making a ring. We did an example like this coming, coming through everything. Didn't have a hydride. I didn't, I didn't realize this one have a hydride shift until I, until I finally saw it. I didn't, I didn't realize it doesn't have a hydride shift built in. But we had to do a hydride shift to get the right cation. How we do? Is it coming together a little bit? John, did we get everything answered, Nathan? Yeah. Why does a strong sterically hindered base producing the alkene in a place where it's, it's less substituted? Uh, you sound like you're talking about test three chemistry. What page are you on? Uh, it's in chapter nine. It's just, I was looking at, they, they have um, descriptions of these problems. Um, yeah, well, I don't follow the book in order. We, we skipped test three chapters. Uh, and they're referring to some test three material. We haven't, we haven't covered that. They're making alkenes. Right? Right, yeah. We haven't learned how to make alkenes yet. Um, during test three, we will make alkenes. Actually, we'll be going backwards. One way to make alkenes is to remove water from an alcohol or remove HBr from an alkyl bromide. You, you eliminate okay. uh, We're doing addition reactions. We're adding HBr or adding water. The opposite of addition is to eliminate it. We're not doing any elimination. We're not doing any elimination. Actually, the other organic professors do test three before test two. I mean, they do, I, I do test two and three in that order. The other organic professors switch that and do test three, my test three material first. I think it's better to start with alkene chemistry. Um, one book that we used to use did start with alkene chemistry but we've gone away from that book, but I stuck with covering alkene chemistry first. To me, the material that we covered during test three is a touch more difficult because we have many more things to consider. With alkenes, it's pretty, the reactions are pretty straightforward. You just do this. I mean, with mechanisms, you have to look for shifts or something. But to do a hydroboration, it's, it's sort of the same thing. You see an alkene, you see BH3, you know what it's going to do. When we get to test three, you see two reagents, you're going to have choices of what you can do. And to me, that's more sophisticated, and I think we need to start with alkene chemistry first. It's more straightforward. Um, that's just a choice I've made. 
And so, but it does go against this textbook order. Okay. But we have outlines, and uh, by outlines, use the index to your chap to your uh, to find stuff. Uh, question. Mark, can you turn over your Which one? Eleven. 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 Page eighteen, number eleven. Ah. How many Carl Carbons does this molecule have? What's the definition of a Carl Carbon? Four different things attached? That, that kind of works. But if you broaden that, it's, it's, it's a carbon with no symmetry around it. But a carbon with four different things works. By the way, can you have chiral nitrogens? Yes, you can. Can you have chiral uh, sulfurs? Yes, you can. We're just focusing on chiral carbon. Lots of other molecules could be uh, lots of other atoms could be chiral. Um, but the four different things on a carbon works. So that, that tells you there's no symmetry at that carbon. Do you see a carbon with four different things attached? No, I don't. What's the geometry of uh, this carbon on the left? Planar. If something is planar, you're going to be able to slice right through it. Now, not this book, because if I slice right through this book, I would have a cover on one side and a back page on the other. So I can't slice right through it. Because the atoms are like, like this. The atom has the same on both sides of the plane. It doesn't have like a, something written on this side and something written on this side. Like a piece of bread. You have a, a nice piece of bread, you can slice right through it, and both sides should be the same. Not this book, but an atom should be. A planar atom arrangement should have a plane right through it. That has a plane right through it, that has a plane right through it. What's the geometry of that carbon in the middle? Linear. 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 But it's also planar. We often leave that part out. We call it trigonal planar, why don't we call it linear planar? Let's call anything linear is planar. Where not everything trigonal is planar. That's all. Well. About, I had to check myself. I'm about to say that's all planar through there. It's actually not. What's the question? Is it chiral or not? Isn't that the question? Yeah. Is it, okay. So, what do we look for to determine if the compound is chiral? Not just an atom, but the whole compound. Still plane of symmetry. And by the way, I'm kind of lying to you. 99% of the time, it's plane of symmetry. There's there's a little bit broader statement that works 100% of the time, but it's not worth confusing you. Uh, but for us, 99.9% of the time, we're looking for plane of symmetry. Where's Waldo? Does this is compound have a plane of symmetry? Well, I was about to say everything's planar, you can slice right through it like a piece of bread. But actually not. Can you draw this molecule out? Um, with all of its bond angles. Let's do that. What's the hybridization? Okay, and a lot of this is sort of review. It's, it's a lot of from test one, but guess what? Final exam comprehension. What do we say that hybridization of this left part is? Yes, yeah, SP2 trickle planar. How about the one on the right end? SP2. And the one in the middle? SP2. Good, it's SP. Okay, let's let's build this molecule. I got a carbon that's trigonal planar. I'm going to draw the plane in the board.
Is this carbon look trigonal planar? So the plane of the board is trigonal, 120 degree bond angles. What's left over on that carbon? A P orbital. SP2 with a P orbital. There it is. How many P orbitals does the middle carbon have? SP. SP has two, two hybrids and how many P's? We started with one S and three P's. To get SP, we put two in the blender, create SP's. What's left over? Two P's. That's two P orbitals. Okay? One of them I'm going to put right here. I'm going to put an electron in there, electron here, and overlap that to make that pi bond. See the pi bond? There it is. Then this is bonded to a carbon that's also a trigonal planar. But is this plane if this pi system is straight up and down, this is going back and this is coming forward. It's like I've turned it like this, like we turn the alkene sometimes. And the pi bond is coming straight up. And there. How is the other pi bond on this part? Here. There's two of them. The other one's perpendicular to that. If this one's straight up, the second one is coming out at you. I can't draw that. Coming out at you, I'm going to do it like that. Now this has a pi bond here. This has one p orbital, it's sp2. How is this p orbital oriented? Is it oriented to line up with p orbital A or B? B. Yes, it's, it's oriented to line up with B.
What's the purpose of me asking you this? Not so much for you to figure it all out, but maybe to prompt you to make some models. And also for you to see an example of a compound that does not have power carbons, yet it's a carbon molecule. Um, this, this really did me. We really need a model. The more important thing here, though, is the review of the orbitals. That, hopefully, you follow. So how do we know that these... Because, because one, if one of the orbitals is straight up, the other one is like this. And so, one of them is interacting with the straight up orbital. And the other one is interacting with the orbital like this. So two orbitals are like this. And then the other two are like this. But see that the middle carbon has both. But getting from there to the lack of a plane, is there? Yes. Okay, guys. Um, Thank you.